Well, it's been awful hard for people to accept HIV AIDS as a disease, not a criminal offense. I was 10 when my dad was diagnosed with polio, and many of the things that families with HIV were facing were the same kind of issues that my family faced. The fear, the discrimination, the isolation. Um, I actually drove from Tulsa to Wichita, Kansas for almost three years to get treatment because of the stigma and my fear of the you know, how I might be treated if anybody found out. Early on, in the, when I first became public about living with HIV and I had a listed telephone number, I used to get a lot of um, hate calls. If you don't know where you've been, then you don't know where you're going. In the late 80s, I was in seminary here in Tulsa, and I had a friend who worked at St. John's Hospital as a nurse, and she called me one afternoon and said, there's a young man here who's been in the hospital for over a month. He's dying of AIDS. Would you mind coming by to see him? I knew nothing about HIV AIDS. I was new to seminary. and. Um, but I said, of course, I will absolutely do that. About 96, I um, had read an article about black women and HIV, and it kind of just like shocked me. So, and it was an Essence Magazine article, and um, it was talking about black women being infected in large numbers, and it kind of freaked me out because I was married to a cheating man and was trying to get out of the relationship, and now I had to think about HIV, and so, it took me about three months to go get a test. I was a nervous wreck. Finally went and got it and came back negative. But I kind of thought, if I'm that scared, how many other black women don't know like I did? And, and when they find out that they may be in at risk for getting HIV, how scared are they to go get a test? And so I started going door to door in North Tulsa and handing out a flyer, a flyer that I still have about HIV and African American women. and. Uh, I did that for about two years, and I can remember going to people's houses, and they'd be like, uh, not tell them about it, and they'd go, and they'd go do you know my husband? <laughs> no, I don't. When I first got there, um, I went in and I introduced myself, and I said, I'm Reverend Leslie Penrose, and I've come to um, visit you. And he said, don't bother. My church already told me I'm going to hell. So I sat with him for about 30 minutes that afternoon, and. Um, just talked a little bit about how I didn't believe that at all, but mostly just kind of sat there and um, was with him for a while. Well, he asked me to come back the next day, and I actually ended up coming back for every day for almost two weeks and was able to help him get a little bit of closure in his life, and um, he died. And I thought that was kind of the end of it. And then a few days later, I got a call from somebody else who wanted to visit. And then a couple of days later, somebody else who wanted to visit. And within three or four months, um, I was visiting at St. John's and St. Francis and Hillcrest and a lot dealing with people living with HIV and AIDS. Because at that particular time, there really were not a lot of um, religious folks in Tulsa who were connected with that work and who were doing that work. By the time I was 40, um, all of the male close friends in my life had died from this disease or were infected with this disease. And so I was drawn to it. It was a, it was a fight that I couldn't do. I couldn't not do. Um, and I was fortunate enough to um, come to work for Tulsa Cares almost 19 years ago now. I was asked to leave the church that I was serving because people with HIV and AIDS were beginning to come and that wasn't the chosen mission of that church and they were afraid. And So when I left, the bishop invited me then to start a new congregation. We started Community of Hope um, with about 50 people, about half gay and half straight and probably about 40% living with HIV and AIDS. When the AIDS epidemic first appeared in California, it reminded me very much of the early years of the polio epidemic. And I followed it very closely until in the mid-80s, 
it began to come to Oklahoma. And I think that we always believed that in the early years it was an East or West Coast kind of problem and that it probably wasn't going to make it to this state. Native people really felt like it was a white man's disease in the late 80s and the early 90s. We still have people to this day to think it's a gay white male disease. So, you know, you're not white, gay, or male, then what are you concerned about that for? I felt a real draw to trying to help and because the Community Service Council has as its mission bringing people together to solve community problems, I really felt that our organization had a role to play here. I asked my director if I could study what was going on in Tulsa, so I wrote a status report on AIDS in Oklahoma. After the end of the summer, the general consensus was the Community Service Council should begin an effort to plan and guide the AIDS epidemic in Tulsa. And I was asked to do the staffing for the AIDS Coalition, which we organized in September of 1988. She really took the lead and, and, and tried to make the community understand that this was something that, that the Tulsa community needed to worry about and needed to be concerned with. And she really rallied a lot of individuals in the community to, to start the AIDS Coalition and to really start, the, start that process in Tulsa. And, you know, it's amazing that that's still going on today. I, I think one of the things that really held Tulsa together was that we had the AIDS Coalition of Tulsa and it brought people together and we tried to work together instead of going against each other. I remember being so incredibly proud that we had a community that refused to put its head in the sand and pretend like it didn't exist. Definitely we've had a philanthropic community in Tulsa that has been supportive of trying to help provide um, financing for organizations that were working with this epidemic and you know without them we wouldn't have been able to do the things that we, we've been able to accomplish either. I call them citizens of the world. Um, some of the people who gave money that were some of our main co contributors in the early years, they feel a sense of social responsibility for helping with major health and human service problems. A lot of those people probably will never really, really know the impact that they've had on individual lives and um, how important it has been for, for them to do what they did. early days provided some difficulties for many of us, especially educators, because you can't really do HIV without talking about sex and talking about condoms, and that was banned oftentimes. The religious barrier was an issue, the fear of administration, the fear of parents, the fear of teachers, the fear of kids, that was like one of the biggest barriers. Fear. <laughs> it was that stigma. Nobody wanted to talk about it, nobody would talk about it. So we, it was all about trying to find creative ways to get the message out, but not offend somebody. It really depended on the educator and the relationship that, that they developed with that community or with that organization or with that church. Um, it was a sales job. <laughs> How do we sell this to get in the door to do some education and do it in a manner that was proper for them, and yet we got our message across. We were the first state, you know, in the United States to mandate AIDS, AIDS education in the public school system. This community was really cutting edge. I think collectively with that state school law, that has helped us a whole lot be able to reach groups that we may not have been able to reach. I'm grateful for those of you that have done the AmeriCorps stint. So I kind of Googled uh, HIV and AIDS in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and lo and behold, National AIDS Fund AmeriCorps popped up. <laughs> I wanted to do something. I wanted to be part of my community. The reason I got involved with AmeriCorps was I had lost my partner 15 years. I met Janet, Janice and then they kind of rehearsed me. And I filled out the uh, application for AmeriCorps, 
and was accepted on the very first team here in Tulsa through what was at that time the National AIDS Fund in Washington, D.C. I did RAIN full-time my first year. So at that time, RAIN stood for uh, Regional AIDS Interfaith Network. My part in doing RAIN that year was they needed somebody to focus a little bit more on African Americans. And so that was really their first year of being able to get into black churches in large numbers like we did. My very first placement was at a place called Visiting Nurse Association, or VNA. And we had the contract with the state to case manage the patients that were on the Ryan White program. That second year, I was at Hospice of Green Country, primarily doing the same thing, you know, casework, you know, with patients living in the community. They asked me to stay, stay on with them, and the only opening they had that really fit for me was in the accounting department, which is, you know, what I'd done in school some. And so that's where I went, and um, that's still where I am today. It, 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 it saved my life, I can say that. Because I, I think at that point, I could have really given up and died. And it wouldn't have been nothing else. But it gave me something to do. And it made me feel like I was appreciated. And I, that was what was important to me at that point. I needed to know that it wasn't over. Most grown people want to go back to high school or go back to their college years. I want to go back to my AmeriCorps years. I served um, on the AmeriCorps team for two years. And those two years completely changed my life. Oh, so many people suffered to get us to where we are now. They would do HIV AIDS walks when they were at their own, on their own deathbed. They would still be out there advocating for change and telling their stories when it wasn't safe to tell their stories, um, taking all kinds of risks so that the future could be different than it was then. And it is. It is. It is because they lived their lives fully for other people and not just for themselves. You know, it's good that we're living longer and we're healthy and all of that, but you have to remember, you have to have reminders of where we come from in order to know that we need to keep doing what we're doing to keep going farther forward. The, the HIV and AIDS community in Tulsa has always, to my perception, been a strong community. It hasn't always been large, like numbers of people but it's always been a strong, the, those of us that, that were involved in the beginning, in the middle, and, and even those today, are, are strong people and are committed people. I think that's the way we've got to keep looking at the HIV AIDS community is through the eyes of the AIDS Coalition. We've got to stay together and kind of respect each other's character in the community to still make it successful because I really think we're successful compared to a lot of other communities. It's still an um, important part of, of the fight and the effort uh, against HIV in our community. Only about 60% of the people in the Tulsa area who are living with HIV and AIDS and know it are connected to medical care and treatment. So we still have a lot of work to do, even though we've come a long way. People aren't dying like they used to, but someday in the future it might be something else. You know, and I hope that they're able to look at what, what we did, if that ever happens in the future, to look what we did around HIV and AIDS and that what we've learned and how to organize um, against a, 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 a disease. I don't believe there's anything that we can't do as a community. I, don't, I know that there will always be um, stumbling blocks along the way. But as long as we keep our eye on the prize, you know, as, long as, we, as long as we get really focused on what we want and we, and we don't get involved in all of the chatter on the sidelines, and we just stay very focused on, on the outcome that we want, 
um, and we do it with kindness and cooperation and collaboration, all of those, um, all of those words that we use, but if we really put our money where our mouth is and actually walk that walk, there's nothing that we can't do.